We're thrilled today to have Kurt Tong here with us. He is currently the Consul General of the United States in Hong Kong and has had a sterling uh, career in the U.S. Department of State, um, including being ambassador to APEC, Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation, the Deputy Assistant Secretary uh, of State for Economic and Business Affairs, and a whole hosting, a whole host of other postings which are in his bio. But um, we're looking forward to hearing about something which we don't talk about nearly often enough, which is what is going on in Hong Kong and the U.S. government role. But thank you so much for being here. Great. Thank you. So I yeah. go up here. Mr. Diet Coke with me. Good evening, everybody. Thank you very much um, to the National Committee for this opportunity and, uh, and also special thanks to Dorsey Whitney for being our host this evening. Uh, my, I'm on a bit of a campaign, as, as you might guess, to, to try and raise awareness in the United States about Hong Kong uh, and the U.S. relationship with Hong Kong uh, and with Macau. Because uh, our consulate is responsible for, for both jurisdictions. But tonight I'll focus uh, uh, just on Hong Kong. And, and, and uh, if you want to take a nap for the next 15 minutes, the, the, the main point of, of what, I'll, what I'll describe to you all is that Hong Kong is a, is a well-functioning, uh, economically important, uh, regionally significant city succeeding in its mission to be a very distinct entity that adds real value to the region, to the U.S.-China relationship, uh, and to itself because of the existence of a one country, two systems framework, which is still largely intact. So that, that's the short version. I'll give you a little bit more, though, for your money. Uh, and for Dorsey's uh, wine and cheese. The, um, let me start by, by giving, uh, for people who haven't spent a lot of time thinking about Hong Kong, just a very short version of, of the framework that, that, uh, that covers the, both Hong Kong's governance as well as the relationship with the United States and then, and then go on from there to describe uh, some, of the, some of the core strengths that result from that framework as well as some of the challenges that, that Hong Kong faces uh, now in the, in the 21st uh, century. The, uh, in 1997, as you all know, China resumed sovereignty over, uh, over Hong Kong, ending um, well more than 150 years of British colonial rule, and is now incorporated as a special administrative region of China, where uh, under the basic law, which was um, a subsidiary, if you will, of the Sino-British Declaration that, that governed the handover of, of Hong Kong. Uh, under the basic law, most matters um, related to the governance of Hong Kong are um, exercised by, by the autonomous authority of the Special Administrative Region, although some aspects of Hong Kong's governance uh, remain in the hands of the Central People's Government. Um, those include foreign relations uh, and defense. Uh, but aside from those areas, for the most part, uh, Hong Kong is, is, a, is a separate jurisdiction and, and exercises authority over its own affairs. Uh, the goal of that framework, which was established by Deng Xiaoping back in, in the 1980s, uh, philosophically and then, and then put into the Sino-British Joint Declaration and then in, into the Basic Law, which was negotiated um, closely and including by, by many Hong Kong participants, uh, under that, that the, the goal of that framework is to continue to have a lively um, uh, uh, entity, uh, economic entity, using the language of the 20th century capitalist, sort of a city that would continue to walk the capitalist road while still being a part of China and, then, and thereby contribute to China's uh, economic and social development. Um, so under that framework, Hong Kong is a separate customs territory can sign international agreements on its own on, on matters of commercial uh, and economic affairs uh, and as well as certain legal matters. Uh, and because of that, from the United States perspective, uh, our relationship with Hong Kong is governed by the 1992 U.S. Hong Kong Policy Act, uh, which is designed to allow the United States to treat Hong Kong like a separate jurisdiction for most matters of, of, of international affairs. Uh, and in recognition of the high degree of autonomy that, that Hong Kong uh, enjoys. Um, that 
results in a rather uh, vigorous relationship between the United States and Hong Kong where we attempt to reinforce its autonomy both in, in, in word and, and in deeds, um, including having extensive bilateral agreements with Hong Kong authorities, uh, uh, broad-reaching law enforcement cooperation, um, lots of high-level visits between, between the, uh, the two locations, and, and we seek to serve our large community of US citizens and, and visitors um, to Hong Kong. And in that context, Hong Kong, of course, is, is, is quite successful and quite busy economically. Um, it's important to note that Hong Kong is, is, of course, as you all know, a global financial center. Um, it has Asia's, arguably Asia's most sophisticated financial markets, uh, the world's busiest cargo airport, the world's fifth large busiest container port. Um, all of this results in, a, in a rela an economic relationship with the United States that is very extensive. Uh, we have um, what, well upwards of $60 billion uh, invested in Hong Kong from the United States. We maintain a $32 billion trade surplus with Hong Kong. I like to rub that in the faces of my fellow chiefs of mission, saying, uh, I, you know, I, we have the largest uh, trade surplus that's obviously due to the efforts of our consulate, uh, not to anything else. Uh, and of course, you know, the ambassador in, in Beijing is a dismal failure because of the $600 billion um, uh, trade deficit that we have with the rest of China. The, um, so all in all, uh, a, a positive state of affairs stemming from uh, the one country, two systems framework. To illustrate that a little bit more, uh, the Heritage Foundation uh, continually, year after year, ranks Hong Kong as the world's freest economy. The International Management Institute for International Management and Development places Hong Kong a, a close second after the United States uh, in the world uh, competitiveness ranking. Um, I think perhaps more significantly than either of those two, the World Bank uh, uh, ranks Hong Kong number five in its ease of doing business index, which is a, a measure of several things like construction contracts, um, how hard it is to set up a new company, uh, the, the, the existence of rule of law, the defensibility of contracts, uh, and the like. And in fact, Hong Kong's uh, tradition of rule of law, based around being a common law jurisdiction and, and having inherited most, not just its legal framework, but, but, but the, the practices whereby it implements that legal framework <coughs> from, from the UK, uh, it, it has uh, a, a governance system which is generally considered to be extraordinarily reliable. Uh, judiciary, which is independent and makes judgments on its own recognizance without, without interference from either the Hong Kong government uh, uh, or the, the central government. Uh, and that results in, in high reliability and reinforces the strengths of the, of the financial center, which, which helps drive Hong Kong's economy. Hong Kong has a dollar peg, um, very stable exchange rate. That, make, that is a, a policy which is endorsed by the International Monetary Fund. Uh, and, and helps Hong, Kong, uh, Hong Kong's financial markets again as well and is recognized as having good governance uh, generally. From the U.S. perspective, one of the, the uh, key aspects of all of this is that Hong Kong is on this side of the, what you know, people popularly call uh, the Great Firewall of China. Um, the internet is wide open. Um, there's, there's open access, unfettered access to, to e-commerce um, to and from Hong Kong uh, and to the extent that the, the companies decide that that is in their interest and, and, uh, and, and the shipments can be made safely. The, um, it, uh, that, that existence of, uh, at, as we go forward into this century and considering the future business models, uh, that presence of Hong Kong uh, as a, as a place where data flows, cross-border data flows, are uninhibited and data privacy practices are, are uh, follow global best practices is extraordinarily important when one thinks about the, the future shape of the Hong Kong economy. Um, as a result of all this, we have 1,400 US firms operating in Hong Kong. That's just an estimate because we, we don't require them uh, to register uh, with us and, and, uh, and sometimes the nationality of firms is is, is unclear. 
that there are at least 1,400, and at least half of those are regional headquarters for operations uh, around Asia. Um, contrary to, to popular myth, we have not seen uh, U.S. companies leaving Hong Kong, and in, in fact, for every one that, that gets picked off by Singapore's uh, various incentives or, or, or other uh, locations, uh, attractive locations around the Asian region, um, another one comes into Hong Kong, and the, that number uh, has, has, has been quite steady. The, um, a recent climate, business climate survey by the American Chamber of Commerce found that, that uh, U.S. firms consider Hong Kong not only to be an excellent point of access uh, into the Asian, into the Chinese economy, but also a, a great place to do business um, with, with, the, uh, with the rest of Asia. Um, I could go on and on about all the various advantages of, of Hong Kong system. From the U.S. perspective, one of the things that we look at is the enforceability of our own bilateral understandings. Uh, and we are able, for example, to maintain a strong strategic trade controls regime consistent with practice with other developed economies, uh, even though Hong Kong uh, is, part of, is part of China. Uh, the, um, uh, the legal system, which I referred to earlier, is also a real attraction for, for US, US firms. Um, as I said, Hong Kong is a common law jurisdiction <clears throat> that the independence of its judiciary is only reinforced by the participation of foreign judges uh, in, in Hong Kong's uh, judicial system, including on the Court of Final Appeal. In fact, just most recently, uh, the, um, the Hong Kong approved two uh, high-level judges from, from Canada and the UK to participate uh, on the Court of Final Appeal, and they'll actually not only be foreigners, they'll also be the first women uh, to participate in, um, on, in the Hong Kong Court of Final Appeal. Um, the, uh, um, we are able to, as I said, not only do export controls, we also have extensive law enforcement cooperation with Hong Kong. The, uh, um, one of the reasons why our consulate uh, is, is the largest in, in, in Hong Kong is the presence of eight U.S. law enforcement agencies uh, that, that work very closely with Hong Kong Discipline Services on very practical matters of, of, of law enforcement. Um, I'm, I'm happy to say that our, our drug enforcement agency and other agencies working together with, with Hong Kong authorities have had quite a good track record of late, um, contributing to, to uh, dozens of arrests, uh, something along the lines of 500 pounds of seizures, um, 40,000 counterfeit items being caught by the Customs Bureau, um, six, 6,500 firearms that weren't supposed to go someplace didn't go there as, um, as, a, as a result of our cooperation with, with uh, Hong Kong law enforcement. Those are just sort of practical examples of the kind of, 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 uh, of cooperation. Uh, one area that, that is becoming increasingly important in uh, US, Hong, U.S. Hong Kong law enforcement cooperation is um, countering fraud, um, and particularly online scams where uh, uh, hackers or evildoers, if you would call them that, based in either the United States or China or Hong Kong are working together in cross-boundary fashion to bilk people out of money. Uh, and that includes companies um, and even, um, even law firms, like where we are today, uh, have been cheated to the tunes of millions or tens of millions of dollars. That, that's, a, that's a significant criminal threat, and, and Hong Kong is one of the places where we have the best cooperation uh, in Asia in trying to combat that kind of, uh, uh, of activity. So I've given you a bunch of good news, right? <coughs> you get the point yeah. that, that, uh, that, that Hong Kong is, is, a, is a viable framework for, for cooperation uh, and, a, and a successful uh, exhibitor of, of, uh, in utilizing the strengths of the one country, two systems framework. What are some of the challenges that we face uh, in, in the Hong Kong context? If, if you ask our, uh, the American Chamber of Commerce, <clears throat> one of the main concerns that they've, they've, their membership has expressed in, in recent polls is actually a, 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 an atmosphere of conservatism and, if you will, red tape um, come in, in the Hong Kong government context that they're not displeased with the decisions that are, that are being made, although there are, there are occasionally some regulatory decisions which um, 
neither the U.S. business community nor the U.S. government uh, agree with, but it's not so much the decisions themselves as the, as the pace of decision making and the speed of getting uh, approvals and judgments. And, and there's a certain um, conservatism that, that seems to be emerging in how the Hong Kong government addresses different issues. Um, another, that, that is a particular concern with respect to one key area that the business community um, is increasingly focused on, which is the cost of doing business in Hong Kong. Um, land prices are extraordinarily high, um, and, prop and property prices uh, are going up with them, both for residential as well as commercial use. Uh, that that if <coughs> trend, if it continues without, without some interruption coming from some policy interventions, uh, could in fact be quite a significant threat to the competitiveness of Hong Kong. Excuse me, <clears throat> a lot of talking these days and I'm starting to lose my voice. But um, the good news is that the chief executive, Carrie Lam, and, and her government are quite seized with this issue and appear to be ready to take on the very, very difficult politics, um, which I, we have no specific recommendations from the U.S. side for what they should be doing, but we do hope that they'll do something and, and, the, and that it will be big um, because there are very strong interest groups um, pulling uh, the government in different directions and, and trying to, to lobby against concerted action uh, on, on the property front. And, and, uh, and we hope that the government will push through and come up with a clear plan that creates confidence that the land supply and the, and the housing supply in particular will start to be, to be met uh, going forward. Another area of challenge in, in Hong Kong is uh, with respect to uh, what I was des describing earlier is a very important aspect of Hong Kong is the whole question of, of, of freedom of information uh, and, and, uh, uh, and the role of the media. There are voices in Hong Kong that say that, that there is some degree of self-censorship taking place in, in, uh, in the Hong Kong media. Uh, and there's some concern that because Hong Kong is part of China, that China's uh, extraordinarily tight approach to media freedom and freedom of expression could somehow find its way into, uh, in, into Hong Kong. Um, at this stage, that is more of a, of a, of a worry than a fact, but it, but, it's, but it is a worry, and because it, it's such an important um, issue, people are, 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 quite, are quite focused on it. As I said earlier, the whole question of, of, uh, of maintaining an unfettered internet is extraordinarily important to Hong Kong's um, competitiveness. The, um, uh, uh, for example, the, the, the recent cybersecurity law in, in China um, has implications for the, the, the means of doing business, which if anything even remotely similar to that were, were implemented in Hong Kong, it could have a considerable chilling effect on, on financial services, legal services, consulting services, and everything pretty much every other kind of, of, of high-end um, economic activity that has made Hong Kong very successful, and so we hope that that doesn't take place. Um, and, and people are quite familiar, I think, with, if they hon follow Hong Kong affairs, with the whole question about the, the course of, of democracy in, in, in Hong Kong. Uh, and so a few words about that. Um, from the U.S. perspective, put simply, more democracy Hong Kong has a certain amount, but even more democracy would be even better uh, in terms of reinforcing the best instincts of the government and improve and maintaining good uh, information flows and transparency in in, uh, in government operations. So, from our perspective, um, we think it would be great if Hong Kong would uh, more fully implement the ideas that are outlined in the. In Article 68 of the Basic Law, which says that the the ultimate aim uh, is the election of all the members of the Legislative Council by by universal suffrage, and we would also favor a more uh, inclusive selection process for the Chief Executive, um, essentially because such a system would, in a very fundamental way, provide a, a source of stability and. Uh, legitimacy in a difficult situation. 
because the, the special administrative re region of government from the chief executive on down is, as is, I think quite clear, uh, needs to be responsive both to the central government but also to the people of Hong Kong. And that balancing act, um, I think, the US government thinks, would be something that is, would be easier to accomplish if Hong Kong had, had a higher degree of, of democracy, allowing for a, a positive cycle of government transparency and, and democratic uh, accountability. The, the last worrisome thing that I'll mention in this, this quick briefing is the role of the, of the mainland government in, and its approach um, towards Hong Kong. Now, it's important to remember the main point here and the point that you all need to take home is that Hong Kong is a success. It has worked. The one country, two systems framework is viable and there is a high degree of autonomy. But there, there you know, are some counter trends uh, visible in the mainland approach towards Hong Kong that can create um, or present cause for concern for foreigners as they look at, at, the, at the way the overall um, system runs. Um, for example, um, back in about a year and a half ago in November 2017, the National People's Congress Standing Committee uh, implemented an interpretation of the basic law, which had a, a very significant impact on, on the, uh, the oath-taking process and the implications of people's participation in the oath-taking process for the Legislative Council. Now, the, the Standing Committee, the NPC Standing Committee, has the right to do that under the basic law and under, under the arrangements that, 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 that govern uh, Hong Kong. But we, from the US side, questioned whether that was a good idea to proactively make those judgments um, because of their extensive impact on Hong Kong politics, uh, also because of the fact that there was a pending case before the courts in Hong Kong. And Hong Kong, under the basic law, is intended to have uh, judicial independence, and the, the, the Court of Final Appeals in Hong Kong um, is established as having final uh, the the ability to have final judgment in interpreting the basic law. And so from the US perspective, it would have been better if, if that had just gone through the Hong Kong courts and the Court of Final Appeal had reached a judgment uh, with respect to the whole oath-taking enterprise uh, rather than have the, the mainland government step in. Some other examples are in the rhetoric uh, that, that has come out from the mainland. Um, for example, um, Mr. Li Fei, very smart man, uh, but who, but he, you know, and when recently uh, serving as the chair, uh, he's now moved on to a different responsibility. But when he was chair of the Basic Law Committee, um, uh, used the phrase that got us quite concerned uh, that the central government jointly administers Hong Kong, and it, it's a little bit vague, but it, but it seems to push in the wrong direction of of uh, saying that there, you know, that that there's a certain legitimacy to the central government in detail having uh, a voice in the day-to-day -day affairs of the, of, the, of, the, of the Hong Kong government. That's not what he said. He said, just, all he said was jointly administers. But the implication is, is more in that direction than it is the sense that Hong Kong has a high degree of autonomy um, and the mainland supports the, the philosophy of Hong Kong people governing Hong Kong and, and the mainland is okay with that. So there's a, there's, there's a very sort of subtle uh, conversation taking place, and we're, we're usually quite careful in commenting on this because it's important to be, to be right and also to be justified in your statements. Um, but, but there is some cause, cause for concern uh, on this front. And, and, uh, and so in our recent Hong Kong Policy Act report, um, we said that, that there have been issues, there have been um, statements and actions coming out of the central government which we see as inconsistent with the intentions of the basic law and the one country two systems framework and we would like to see more statements like others that have been made um, by the central government for example Xi Jinping recently uh, at the uh, important spring meetings you know reiterated the phrase of emphasizing high degree of autonomy for Hong Kong Hong Kong people governing Hong Kong and that's, that's a good thing to hear. 
that reassurance from, from a foreign perspective as we think about the future viability of Hong Kong is important. Uh, to hear those reassuring notes that the mainland continues to see the value of one country, two systems framework being something that, that includes two systems as the value and not just one country. I have, I have a lot of debates actually, uh, debates, not the right word, the conversations with tea, tea time with, with mainland authorities when we discuss this and, and the conversation usually runs along the lines of, of us agreeing that one country, two systems is great and me emphasizing that two systems is what is important to the United States and, and the mainland um, personality stressing that yes, but you can't have two systems without one country. And um, so that, that's the conversation. The, uh, um, in this context, the last thing I should probably touch upon is the whole question of, of the, US, the broader U.S.-China relationship and the, and the uh, implications for Hong Kong such as they are. The, uh, I think writ large, uh, both the United States and, and China are satisfied with the, the direction that Hong Kong has taken under um, the Special Administrative Region approach, under the one country <clears throat> two systems framework. It works for China, it, it works um, for the United States. But there is, there is a, this fact of, of re somewhat heightened tension and concern between the United States and China with respect to our economic relationship. And Hong Kong is very much an economic player. So there is a question of what will happen uh, if anything, to Hong Kong as, as a result of the, the ongoing um, intense conversation between uh, the U.S. and China about our bilateral economic relationship. I think there's a couple aspects of this that I'd, that I'd like to emphasize. The first is that it's undeniable that there could be some indirect impact on, on Hong Kong. Even though Hong Kong is a separate customs jurisdiction and the United States will respect that, uh, in its implementation of any of any trade actions vis-a-vis -vis China, uh, the 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 uh, uh, fact that Hong Kong, uh, a lot of the economy is driven by both material trade as well as new transactions being reached between the United States and China. There is a possibility; cannot deny the possibility that that um, that Hong Kong could be, if you will, uh, a bit of an innocent bystander. That, that suffers somewhat from U.S.-China economic uh, tensions. On the positive side of things, however, and I, I tend to emphasize this um, with Hong Kong interlocutors, the very fact of <clears throat> the dissatisfaction that's being expressed between the United States and China with respect to our economic relationship actually raises the profile of Hong Kong uh, and, and points out that Hong Kong is a very special place. Excuse me, just get my voice back. In a very, in a very real sense in this context, uh, Hong Kong, by being this highly successful, rules-based, global best practices respecting jurisdiction inside China, <coughs> um, looms more important in the context of, of, of uh, a fraught U.S.-China economic relationship. And, and I have argued that Hong Kong can actually utilize this situation to uh, exert um, a little bit of what I would call demonstration power. Uh, the fact that uh, by serving as an example of what can be achieved through the respect of global best practices, uh, by showing that it is, in fact, in many ways, the best run part of China, and it does that in a way that is consistent with, with, with international norms and practices. I think it kind of points a direction, a positive direction, that, that, uh, that China could also follow uh, and, and that would help ameliorate uh, a lot of the tensions between um, the United States and, and Hong Kong. And so what I, in that context, what I've been urging Hong Kong friends to, to do, uh, although it is difficult when you're in a relationship where the central government is a higher authority than, than, than the Hong Kong government, um, uh, urging Hong Kong people to be loud about Hong Kong's advantages and to express them uh, and, and, and 
show confidence in the fact that one can be a Chinese jurisdiction or a Chinese person or a Chinese company and respect global best practices and international rules and be highly successful. Um, all of that can be done and, and hopefully our, our friends in Beijing will see that and, and, and look upon it in a positive light and, and work with the United States to try and find plus some outcomes to, to, to uh, some of our ongoing disagreements. So with that, let me uh, turn it over to you all to start throwing, uh, throwing vegetables at me uh, and, and criticism and, and uh, interested in questions as well uh, and look forward to the conversation. Thank you very much. Let me start with one which I think I didn't ask you earlier, which is there was this kind of um, controversy surrounding an extradition request that the United States made to Hong Kong. Can you shed some light on that? Sure. The, um, uh, we included that in our uh, Hong Kong Policy Act report this year, and it got a little bit of media attention. But the, the facts of the matter are quite simple. Uh, we um, uh, executed an extradition request on a certain individual um, who um, was suspected uh, of a crime and who we had indicted in the United States. Uh, and he was uh, apprehended in Hong Kong. And, um, and then, uh, at, consistent with our, our understanding <coughs> with, with Hong Kong, some months later, uh, the Hong Kong authorities informed us that he would not be extradited to the United States and instead, uh, and the reason for that was that he was um, under indictment or going to be prosecuted uh, in the mainland. And that, that's consistent with our, with our, our uh, bilateral agreement and so we, we said, okay. And, and, uh, and then went, turned to the mainland authorities and have asked them for clarification of what's happened with the case because we'd like to frankly just basically close the case file one way or the other um, if, if uh, uh, with regard to whether we should maintain a, uh, a live, <coughs> excuse me, a live indictment of this person uh, in the U.S. or, or just, or just kind of close the case. Why did it merit, if it was so normal, why did it merit it to mention? Uh, well, the Hong Kong Policy Act report discusses um, Hong Kong's degree of autonomy and so we thought that the, the fact of the, the um, <coughs> if you will, a mainland re um, request for custody um, uh, being executed uh, while the U.S. had also made a request for custody was a relevant fact. Um, it's not, it's not a, a hugely important uh, event in, in my opinion, actually. What's the extradition treaty provide? The extradition treaty uh, provides for it's a typical extradition understanding. Um, treaty is not the exact word for it. I forget the exact word for it. It's an arrangement for fugitive. I see. It's not uh, an extradition treaty. Okay. Uh, well, it it functions much like an extradition treaty. Judicial so assistance? No. Uh, terminology aside, when you have a one of these arrangements with another jurisdiction, the jurisdiction which has apprehended uh, a suspect on behalf on behalf of the jurisdiction requesting such apprehension has the ability, uh, in fact the obligation, to make their own judgment about whether the case is good enough to, to, um, to send the person to the other jurisdiction and um, whether they want to because it's entirely voluntary. Oh, I see. So it's not an, extra, an extradition treaty. It's literally you receive a request and it's within one of, in an extradition treaty, it's a defined crime that you can extradite. You actually, the, the country that has custody does not have any um, opportunity to not return the, the person. We'd have they to get into They that must return <coughs> I'm not I'm I used not to sure process that. those really? many years ago when I was in the because legal the, advisor's if office. If the, <laughs> but it was a. I think the, I think the, 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 country that, the country that has custody has considerable leeway in, in, as to whether to extra, extradite or not. Right. Somebody want to add we, on we this got, point? Because we're going to go yeah, to this anyways, some other. Yeah, we can go on something else. But yeah. And I realize that's like an issue between the U.S. and Turkey right now, for example, with, right. with respect to a certain gentleman. Right. Yeah. Um, you, you mentioned 
you know, kind of the, the U.S.-China relationship and how, you know, I think it's fair to say we're in a historic downturn, uh, the national security strategy defining China as a, the, the national security strategy defining China as a strategic rival and a revisionist power, the national defense strategy uh, saying we need to spend tons of billions of dollars to defeat and deter China, and then the USTR report uh, saying that China's WTO accession uh, had not benefited the American people. How has that kind of affected your interactions in Hong Kong with the mainland, not with the Hong Kong government, but with mainland folks that you have to meet with when they come and have tea with you or other? Um, they have better tea, so I usually go there. Um, <laughs> the, uh, uh, we have, like, coffee. We, actually, we have Starbucks now in the consulate, so we're kind of excited about that. Wow. The, um, uh, uh, it actually hasn't changed it much at all. So they haven't, they haven't tried to raise the issues with you? I mean, they're not less friendly, they're not less willing to discuss issues like we were just discussing judicial assistance? No change? Actually, no. How did the booksellers' um, events uh, affect kind of U.S. government views of what's going on in Hong Kong? Well, what the, um, you know, is everyone familiar with the bookseller uh, case? There were um, five gentlemen who were active in Hong Kong as 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 publishers and, and sellers of, of of books, and um, and they all ended up being in mainland custody. Um, one of the five, it appears, may have been. Um, uh, Taken from Hong Kong, uh, it, the fact the facts of the case are not n entirely clear, but but there's reason to believe that that was the case. Um, so the 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 uh, British uh, government has concluded that that in this this case of the booksellers, and in particular that case, that there was a um, they've used the word breach of the the Sino-British Joint Declaration and uh, and the and the basic law that stems from it. Um, and we we um, uh, support that British interpretation. Uh, they they are the co-signers of the Sino-British Joint Declaration, and therefore um, we subscribe to their interpretations of it. Uh, so that, that's a serious matter um, because that was the first time that the the, the basic agreements that were reached between the UK uh, and China uh, had been breached. And so the U.S. government has also stated our deep concern uh, about the about these incidents. How about the forceful, uh, the, the, the force? And one of the five gentlemen is still in, in, in China. Um, and Sweden, uh, he's a Swedish citizen, and Sweden is actively um, working to, to try to uh, uh, ameliorate his, his rather egregious human rights situation in China. Have we opined on the, um, the, the forced repatriation of business folks, not, not, not necessarily American citizens, but others who were in Hong Kong and then forcefully repatriated back to the mainland? Well, as a general principle, it's very important that the mainland um, respect uh, Article 18 of the Basic Law, which states that, that mainland law will not be implemented in the special administrative region. Because by respecting that, that article, the, the mainland will reassure and reinforce the confidence of the international community that, uh, that Hong Kong is a, is, a, is a good jurisdiction and that the Basic law is is uh, very much in force and 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 strongly operating. Have we applied? The, the, we're about to there's see. A, there's another gentleman. Wants yeah, uh, we're, we're going to. I'll get to questions. And we'll, okay. th these are supposed to be sequential, which is why I'm continuing down this 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 route. The uh, we're, we're we're about to see the opening of uh, a high speed railway from uh, Hong Kong into the mainland, and the processing. Uh, in order to process people for going into the mainland on this, the mainland is setting up its own effect of almost like an extraterritorial jurisdiction in Hong Kong. Has the U.S. government opined on this, and what do you think this means for the one country, two system? Um, we're, 
observing that since this is starting to feel like a press conference, I'll give you a press conference answer. <laughs> Sorry. Um, the, uh, we're observing the situation closely and, and looking to the, uh, now that, now that it, there's a pending uh, case um, with the Hong Kong judiciary on this matter, we're, we're looking to the Hong Kong courts to, to, um, to, to make the right interpretation of, of the laws which have um, now been passed by the Legislative Council. All right, my, my last question, which is, and I think I know what your answer is going to be, when we support, we, the United States government, support direct elections of the chief executive in Hong Kong. Uh, the Chinese government offered that um, to LegCo, and LegCo rejected it. How, where does the U.S. government stand on that rejection? Uh, we don't have any comment on ac actions taken by the Legislative Council on that matter. Okay, okay. open it up to... Put a, uh, use a microphone, because we want to... Um, my name's Mark Sheldon. I'm a 40-year resident of Hong Kong, affiliated with the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Um, if I could ask you, Mr. Consul General, to broaden your scope a bit, given your wide connection with Hong Kong society now in the last few years, and my, my question is about the generational divide. Um, in your talk, you referred to, you know, Chinese all the time, that people in Hong Kong are Chinese. Yet the, the data of the post-Occupy period for the younger people is that the identity of being Chinese has collapsed entirely. And that the younger generation of people who are active in that movement and young professionals and many parents as well were active in that movement. Many of those people now don't self-identify as Chinese. They, they say they're Hong Kong people. Um, I've sent my student researchers out to talk with all those kids and all those people who demonstrated. And basically there are sort of three reactions. One is opt out because they tried peacefully to get some um, legitimate and genuine political reform and they got nothing. So they're basically going back to their lives. Uh, the next group is the group that says Hong Kong has no future. So it's not the more optimistic view about one country, two systems that you have. It's a very different, more negative view. And those people are planning to leave. So there's a whole nother wave of highly talented, English speaking, well-trained, university educated people who are now going to Queens or LA or New Zealand or wherever they can go. And then of course the third group, which I'm sure you're very aware of, is the more radicalized group that are proposing more provocative actions toward the Hong Kong government or toward the United Front entities in Hong Kong or forming new political parties or running for office and being elected and then being disqualified. So my, my question to you is, how do you sense the sort of generational divide in Hong Kong when you talk to people? I'm sure you're working at a certain level that's quite different than at the university level where I live and work. But I, I'm interested in your, your thinking because the conclusion of all of that in this sharp generational divide is that actually the Hong Kong government, it may be dysfunctional in the future. It, it, it can't be sustainable with that kind of collapse of this Hong Kong reality. That, that it's not a Chinese identity anymore. It's a Hong Kong person's identity. Well, thanks, Mark. Um, the um, I'm not sure about the data, and and to be honest, I haven't studied it closely enough to see whether there's an inflection point uh, around around uh, public attitudes um, uh, around the Occupy uh, movement or or not. Um, I I do know that that there is uh, a lot of people in Hong Kong who. Uh, express concern about polarization uh, of of opinion in 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 the in the city, uh, and that there is are young people who are are concerned about the future of the city. Um, they're also concerned about livelihood issues, um, employment issues. Um, I think it's a well known fact that a lot of people are concerned about you know what what is the future language of the city, what is the the the, the economic um, style of the city, what, you know, how, how expensive is housing going to be, and, and what are their prospects. Um, I must say, though, that I, I, do, I hear 
uh, you know, when I meet with young people as well as with middle-aged people or old people like, like you and me, um, uh, that polarization and, and range of views uh, kind of exists across generation, generationally. Um, and so I'm not uh, sure that there's uh, a definite direction in terms of the level of confidence uh, in, in the, 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 the Hong Kong enterprise, if you will, of, of one country, two systems, uh, that is preordained. Um, and I think that, that confidence in, in, uh, in the framework could go down or it could go up based upon um, how people feel uh, and how the government performs. Uh, and how uh, and the degree to which the mainland respects the framework, and so I think I don't I don't see uh, an, an obvious pessimistic future for the city, um, and I don't want <clears throat> to endorse the idea that it's preordained that that Hong Kong is on a negative trajectory, because in fact there are a lot of positive things to point to about about Hong Kong's um, performance as a society, uh, as an economy, um, that. That uh, that people can can gear off of and uh, and emphasize as well. If you just look at the data as it affects the United States, we have not seen an increase in immigrant visa applications, um, and the number of students tra uh, studying in the United States from Hong Kong is um, is high and but also steady, uh, and and uh, and the usual number of students having completed their studies return to Hong Kong. For um, for positive, positive ventures and participation in Hong Kong society, upon completing those studies, so so we we don't have data that, that supports the idea that is often out there in the press that that everyone is running for the doors. And if you look at our, as I stated in my address, at, at the performance of foreign companies, including U.S. companies, they remain quite positive. I think there there is a there is a, an important aspect of this, which is that if if people are confident in the framework, the framework will be stronger. Uh, and so I want to encourage people to be confident in it, reinforce it, invest in it, and, and I think it will be stronger as a result going forward. Ambassador Platt. Ambassador. My, right, right up front here. Need a mic. Ambassador Platt, by the way, was my first boss in the Foreign Service, so this makes me extraordinarily nervous. <laughs> I'm, I'm here as an old person, um, and when I was first got to Hong Kong in the 60s, um, Hong Kong basically was protected by its Chineseness. In other words, when the Russians and their polemics in the 60s were decrying Hong Kong as a stinking urinal of capitalism, um, everybody ignored that because every pig that crossed the border turned into hard currency. Mm. And because, John, because Hong Kong was a Chinese city and so forth. Nowadays, um, I'm interested in, in what protects Hong Kong. What does Hong Kong do that the Chinese want to know about, even if they will never admit that they learn anything from Hong Kong? And this is to me, the basis for you know future projections of Hong Kong's longevity and maintenance of its status. Uh, thank, thanks. That's a um, very useful way to, to approach the question. I think the um, my sense is that the mainland government um, sees a lot of value in Hong Kong. Um, as, a, as an economic entity, uh, as uh, a financial center, as a, a, a place that channels investment to and from China, uh, and, that it, and that can share best practices in terms of management, in terms of finance, um, and in terms of social uh, entrepreneurship and more sort of soft aspects of, of society although the mainland authorities might be more reluctant to admit um, Hong Kong as a, as a model, um, say, with respect to uh, NGO involvement in, in um, 
in social welfare, for example, which is, you know, uh, Hong Kong has an extraordinary um, number of, of non-government organizations who augment the government in, in assisting uh, um, people that, that need assistance in Hong Kong. And that's something that I think that, that the mainland can learn from and, and, and maybe is learning from, but just not admitting it when it does. The, um, you know, the mainland government, um, people's government, expresses consternation about the liveliness of, of Hong Kong politics. And so from, I think it's a responsibility of the United States and others who uh, have a stake in Hong Kong to state our opinion, which is that liveliness in politics actually reinforces the good governance, which creates a strong economy, which benefits China. Uh, and that, that conversation is important to have. I actually think there's a lot of recognition of those facts um, uh, inside the PRC. Um, and what we would like to see is more uh, expression of that recognition from, from the, the mainland government, which of course is sometimes looking over its shoulder with respect to the impact of its statements about Hong Kong on, on politics inside the mainland. Um, but, uh, but our hope is that the, the mainland will be more um, respectful of, of, um, of open society generally uh, and, and one way of doing that would be to express that it, it likes Hong Kong's open society in addition to its open economy. Peggy. Peggy Blumenthal from the Institute of International Education. Um, getting back to your comment about Hong Kong student numbers holding steady and being good, are you worried at all about the um, very negative conversation that con Congress and FBI and others are having about Chinese students coming to the United States and being spied. Are you worried at all that that's going to spill over into um, how Hong Kong students feel about coming to the U.S. or how the uh, U.S. government feels about students from Hong Kong? Well, as a practical matter, we um, there are we made some some you know relatively minor but 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 perhaps. Um, uh, uh, relevant changes in visa policy for, for mainland students um, studying in the United States. I haven't yet seen uh, much impact on, on, um, on Hong Kong students applying for, for uh, admission to U.S. universities or, or for visas to study in the United States. The, frankly, the, 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 the main things that we've had to overcome in terms of encouraging uh, and trying to increase the number of, of Hong Kong students studying uh, in the U.S. has been the, the price, um, and for for income um, uh, you know, income sensitive students, some of them are you know rich kids and they they can they can buy Harvard much less pay the tuition, um, but 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 many of them are not, and and so that that's that's an issue because financial aid is less available to foreign students. That's a familiar story across countries, uh, across jurisdictions. But the, um, another, which has become quite relevant lately, is uh, safety. Uh, and so we spent a lot of time assuring Hong Kong uh, potential students, as well as their parents, that the United States is actually a very safe place uh, to live and, and study. Um, uh, because they, they do, in Hong Kong having a, an open media, um, people do read about various incidents in the United States uh, and, and become worried as a result. Hong Kong is one of those places where you can't uh, have have weapons, and and uh, uh, and so people sometimes ask about that. Get back here. Hi, uh, my name is Lakshmi. I'm a rising senior at Yale. Uh, I have a quick question about it's safe, freedom. right? <laughs> you feel good at Yale? Sorry, go ahead. It's okay. <laughs> Um, I have a question about the several counter trends that you yourself mentioned. Um, you have, uh, during your talk, you kind of uh, mentioned multiple times about having faith in the uh, one country, two party system, pri uh, primarily the two party, uh, sorry, the two, two, two <laughs> sorry, <laughs> the one country, two system. Um, and I was curious as how, uh, Politically, the U.S. is responding to the consistent pressure China is placing 
on the maintenance of the system. And what I mean by that is the, uh, the increase in these counter trends that you've mentioned, for example, um, as Mark mentioned, the uh, kind of the, for example, the by-elections that happened this year, um, the uh, integration of Mandarin Chinese into the school systems, the integration of Chinese history as education, uh, as mandatory education, things like that. Um, with this continuous pressure, how sustainable is the, the two system uh, solution? And also, um, how are we as a, as a government, or sorry, as a country, uh, how are we, how is our attitude towards these changes? And at what point will this attitude change? So, um, at, the, at the risk of being repetitive, the, I mean, the U.S. government sees the one country, two systems framework as, as very viable and, and, frankly, a raging success. Uh, we, want, we would like to see that maintained, uh, and we believe that, that there are lots of ways that the U.S. can, can express confidence in it. Um, the, the, and you know, we do it by uh, stating our policy, by calling out the mainland government in instances where, where it uh, seems to be overstepping the line in terms of its rhetoric or its actions, uh, and by, by treating Hong Kong as an important place and working both at the government level as well as the private sector level to um, uh, exercise the autonomy and utilize the autonomy that, that, that Hong Kong enjoys. Um, one, a, a catchphrase that I've taken to using is that autonomy is, is, uh, is a use it or lose it proposition. Um, if you use it, you'll, you'll, you, you'll probably keep it. Uh, if, you, if you don't, um, it, could, it could start to fade away. And there, there uh, is a whole question of confidence that I think is really important. Uh, if Hong Kong maintains confidence in the framework, and we maintain confidence in the framework, then I think that the framework will, will, will continue to be viable. Uh, and, and so it's important to uh, uh, exercise all of the aspects and freedoms that are created by the One Country, Two Systems Framework. Um, for example, um, one of my missions this week, uh, in addition to to visiting Capitol Hill and talking to people in the administration was to go to various universities. I would like to see more U.S. universities take a close look at Hong Kong as a place for, um, for cooperative study and activities. And, and there, you know, there are U.S. universities that are, that are taking a fresh look at Hong Kong. There, um, if you think back a few years ago, there was a bit of a gold rush by American universities to try and set up programs uh, in, in mainland China, and a lot of kind of sense that in order to have a, a truly um, Chinese experience, uh, it was important for, for U.S. students to, um, to do activities in the mainland. And also, you know, U.S. universities at the time were trying to get more and more mainland students in order to reinforce their financial situation in the United States. Now, I think a couple of things are different. One is that there is, is, a, is a very healthy supply of, of mainland students at U.S. universities, particularly in graduate programs, and additional recruitment may not be as important because there's a very strong and, and steady flow. Uh, and also, U.S. universities are discovering that actually the mainland can in some ways be a difficult place to, to have programs uh, if you have to worry about uh, the, your, the curriculum being edited or, or other strictures, visa questions and the like that make it difficult to have programs. So in that context, I'm trying to take advantage of that situation and say, hey, here's Hong Kong, Chinese place, great economy, excellent internships, superb job prospects upon completion of study, uh, and you can study whatever you want and say whatever you want, and you don't have to worry about it. Um, and I'm actually finding a pretty positive response from, from U.S. universities in that, in that context. If they do so, that will help reinforce the fact that, well, actually, this two-systems two framework thing is good because it, it results in, in, in increased activity and even more internationalization of Hong Kong, which results 
uh, ultimately redounds to the benefit of the mainland as well. We're out of time, so please join me in thanking. So I had one final judge. advertisement here. Yeah, um, it's been a good advertisement for Hong Kong. Well, it's and an for, advertisement and for, for serving US, in the U.S. government, U.S.-Hong Kong relations. So we got two themes. I'll show them to you. The U.S. loves Hong Kong. Why? Because of the two one country, two systems framework and the viability of it. Okay, you got that point. But this is one of our campaigns. The other one is you'll see this little lapel button that I've got on here. Uh, 175. Any guesses as to why I'm wearing that? Yes. So the, the consulate here in 2018 is celebrating the 175th anniversary of of uh, of of our cons diplomatic presence in, in Hong Kong, which is actually, if you add up the number of years of presence, our oldest. Now just, I'm cheating here because there were there were a couple consuls in. in in Guangzhou before there, there was one in Hong Kong. But, the, but it was very intermittent in the early years, and also there was a gap there in the 1950s, um, 60s, and 70s. So Hong Kong is actually, if you count number of rings on the tree, uh, the, oldest, the oldest diplomatic presence, not just in China, but in all of East Asia. Did you realize that? So the point being, 175 years so far, at least another 175 to come. And the U.S. is going to be active and present and supportive of, of, uh, of right thinking and, and open societies and open economies for at least another 175 years there. So please go home, feel optimistic, have some beers, and enjoy the World Cup. Thank you.